Hi, I'm Kimberly Miller with the Palm Beach Post, and I cover weather, climate, and the environment for the newspaper. And as part of that, I also get to cover critters, and my favorite critter to cover is the shark. So we have a great show for you tonight. And um, first, we're going to thank the sponsors, and that's the Anjari Foundation, Florida Atlantic University, and Florida International University. Um, we've got a loose script that I'm going to try and follow because we have some great videos that go with it, and I don't want anyone to miss any of those. Um, but I tend to go a little bit off sometimes, so please forgive me if you see me looking at my notes to find out where we are in the show. Um, so here we go. Anyone who watches new shows in the morning has seen the powerful images each winter into spring of the annual black tip shark migration along Florida's southeast coast. The aerial videos and still photos of scores of sharks skimming the beach produce a sense of awe and wonder for viewers and maybe a little concern for wary beachgoers unfamiliar with the perennial movement of one of the ocean's top predators and how close they can come to humans with few to no incidents. Because of South Florida's swimming pool clear waters and a geographical funnel that squeezes the sharks between the nearby Gulf Stream current and the coast, scientists have a unique opportunity for shark research here. The migration begins in January with the highest concentrations of sharks appearing in February. Black tips follow the bait fish, they eat the bait fish and they weed out the sick and unhealthy in an ecosystem where they're actually both predator and prey. In the past decade, with intrepid researchers flying planes above the schools of sharks, we've gotten a better understanding of their numbers and the timing of their trips south. In more recent years, Drones were added to increase the understanding of the black tips movements and also help with locating them during fishing excursions to add newly developed tagging devices. The tags can not only track their travels, but also measure movements as detailed as how many times they beat their tails and what time of day they prefer to make their up close visits to the beach. The black tip migration also provides an opportunity to study what preys on them, including the great hammerhead shark. Already, scientists have observed black tips using the shallow waters close to shore to avoid the less agile hammerhead. The use of special underwater technology and equipping sharks with their own personal cameras is also giving researchers a better idea of how sharks see the world. The new information, which has grown substantially in the past 15 years, will help with conserving these magnificent creatures that still have so much to tell us about themselves and their lives. So tonight, we are lucky to have with us three of the nation's top shark researchers and a leader in film production, all based here in South Florida, who are here to share their important information that they have learned with you and give you guys an opportunity to ask questions. So let me introduce them. Florida Atlantic University's Stephen Kajura is a pilot and a shark scholar who monitors the black tip migration along Palm Beach County's coast from the air as well as by boat. He's the director of the school's Elasma Branch Laboratory and produces a report each year that meticulously counts the number of sharks that pass through the area, which I think every year must be like such a task because they look like little raisins to me. I don't know how I could even count all of those. <laughs> Marianne Porter is an assistant professor at Florida Atlantic University. She studies how sharks move, including looking at the fine scale motions of both black tips and hammerheads. Yanni Papastama Tiu is an assistant professor at Florida International University in Miami. He is interested in the physiology of predator and prey and how they have co-evolved. And Carrie Rosenberg, who is co-founder of the Anjari Foundation, just completed producing the third 360 film for Anjari called Generation Ocean Sharks. It features Dr. Kujura and the FAU Elasma Branch Lab. So now we're just gonna chat with some of the, um, with the I wanna say contestants, but <laughs> participants feel like on a game show, sorry. Um, <laughs> Steven, let's start with you. Uh, you've been studying the black tip shark migration for over a decade now. Um, tell us how you got started and a little bit about your story. Sure, so I was, uh, I was at FAU as, a, as a, an assistant professor and I would be contacted by local uh, media outlets. The, the news helicopters would get some great footage of all these sharks close to the beach and the uh, news agencies would contact me and say, what's going on? Why are there so many sharks here? Should we be concerned? And so that was sort of the impetus. I was able to combine my, uh, my love of flying. I'm a pilot. I do that for fun. 
um, and said, you know what, maybe the best way to study these sharks is from the sky. So I took to the sky and started flying along and, and counting the sharks to see how many there were along the, uh, the coastline here. And that project is built. We've started instrumenting them with acoustic transmitters to look at long-term movements along the, uh, the coast. And then also uh, more recently, we've instrumented them with satellite transmitters so we can get, uh, you know, basically locations in real time. Anytime the fin breaks the surface of the water, we're able to see where they are. And where we're going in the future, we're starting to look at some of the predators of these black tip sharks, like the, the bigger sharks, like the hammerheads. So um, it's, it's uh, been a long run, but I think we're trying to develop this overall comprehensive understanding of what's happening with the, uh, the shark populations down here in South Florida. Grau is probably one of the reporters hassling you about why there were so many <laughs> sharks along the shoreline and, and should we be afraid and, and what's going on. <laughs> but I think that's great that your work on the migration was initially fueled by local news reaching out to you. Um, because if, you know, if we see something, then the public sees it. So they're probably asking the same question. Um, it's a great example of how the science community and the public work together. Um, now, Mary Ann. There's so many questions to answer about sharks off our shores, and you've been taking a closer look at the shark schooling. Um, would you please tell us more about your research and, and what you've been up to? Hi, Kim. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, my research really focuses on biomechanics. So what that means is I use engineering and physics to think about how animals work. And so I look at animals at a really small scale, um, basically thinking about how their body moves and understanding how they do that. And we can use these movements to really think about how animals moving. We can think about how their tail is moving, how their body is moving, and we can look at in interactions between inter individuals in groups. My research generally involves working in the lab. So I do a lot of work at FA, FAU Marine Lab at Gumbo Limbo, the environmental complex here in Boca Raton. There I can use really big tanks to have uh, sharks and rays swimming in those tanks and have videos overhead where I can really understand their movement. But the black tip shark migration gave me a really great opportunity to study sharks moving around in their natural environment. Dr. Kajuro was showing me all this video of these sharks swimming around. <laughs> um, I saw them from the airplane and I thought if I could just get closer to the sharks, I could do the same kind of experiments in the ocean that I usually do in the lab. So we were able to start using drones to get video of these um, black tips and also their predator, the hammerhead swimming around here in South Florida. I study really the shapes of these animals and how they move through the water. So thinking about um, a black tip being really torpedo shaped, how does that shape work? How does the head of the black tip move compared to the head of the, or compared to the tail? Um, just like the hammerheads, um, like the one you see here on the screen, have a really weird head. They've got that giant hammer. So how does that shape impact their ability to swim? What does their head end do compared to their tail end when they swim? That, that's super interesting. I guess I never really thought, I mean, you always see the weird hammerhead shape, but we'll talk about that later. Okay. <laughs> it must be fascinating to be able to observe and study the animals in their natural environment and at Gumbo Limbo, which is such a cool place uh, in Boca Raton. Now, Yanni, you have spent your career studying shark behaviors all over the world. Um, so tell us more about how you do this and what you've learned and if anything has surprised you that you've learned. Yeah, so, you know, my, the beginning of my career, my interests really were in shark movements and, and tracking where they go, like migrations and what habitats they use. Uh, and then I started to want to answer questions related to why they were doing what we see them do. What is the reason for these animals to go to these areas? What drives these migrations? When you see them in groups, why are they in groups? So I realized that there was a sort of a wide variety of sensors out there that could measure other things that might answer those questions. So my specialty really is in putting sensors on the animals themselves. So, for example, we have sensors that will measure speed or acceleration or video cameras. So you can actually see right now this is a camera attached to a gray reef shark. So you get this sort of shark point of view of what's going on. We can put sensors in their stomach to see if they're digesting or if they've eaten. So we kind of combine those sensors with the traditional tracking that Steve was talking about. So we can say where they're going, what habitats they're using, but also why they're doing it. 
Um, what I've become really interested in lately is in shark social groups. And you may not think of sharks being social, but what we've realized over the last few years is that they're actually a lot more social than we realize. And by social, I mean they like to hang out with other individuals. But we still don't really understand why they do that. So we're trying to use these sensors uh, to try to answer questions uh, such as why do they form these groups? So I think part of your video um, was a graphic of the how to use a drum line or drum lines. Can you just talk a little bit about what that is and how it's used safely to catch the sharks? Yeah, so when we, you know, we obviously have to catch these animals to put these tags on them. Um, and sometimes there's a few species we can actually swim down and tag free swimming sharks. And that's actually the simplest way to do it. But that doesn't work for a lot of species in a lot of areas. So we have to catch them. Uh, and our, one of our major concerns is that we make sure that the animal is okay during that process. So a drum line is a very simple sort of setup where you have a, a single hook. And the nice thing about it is that when the animal sort of takes the bait, it's still able to swim around. And we're very, very, uh, we check these lines very, very frequently so that pretty much as soon as an animal uh, takes the bait, we're able to go and then process it and put the tag on and then release it. So we use this technique to, to catch great hammerheads, for example. We also then have to physically get these tags back. So that's kind of a, a bit of a challenge. Unlike some of the other tags Steve was talking about, we have to physically recover them because that data can't be transmitted to satellite. So that can be quite a challenge. A tag has to release from the animal and then we have to go and get it. So you must be uh, doing a lot of traveling to find them. I mean, do they get caught in the Gulf Stream and someone finds them in North Carolina or how do you go out and get them? Or well, they get caught in the Gulf Stream and you never see it again. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> so that, that's, that's the problem of working in, you know, there's a lot of great things about South Florida, um, but the challenge is that we're very close to the Gulf Stream. So it doesn't take much for a tag to pop off in there. And if you're not able to get out, let's say some weather comes in, it could be 100 miles away. And, and obviously, at some point, it's impossible to get back. So we, we do lose some tags sometimes, but overall, success is pretty high. Wow, that's so interesting. Uh, I bet you've seen some pretty incredible stuff on your recordings. And we're going to go into that a little bit more later. Um, so our final panelist is not a shark scientist, but a film producer whose goal is to share shark science, share shark science with the public. Um, Carrie, please tell us about what you do and your latest project and what you do is so important because getting, you know, boiling down the science to what pieces where people can digest it is just is super important. Uh, yeah. Um, well, so as you said earlier, I'm one of the founders of Anjari Foundation. Uh, we're a nonprofit that supports marine science research and education. Uh, we like to bring scientists and the public together, share science with our community. Um, so in 2018, we began this uh, by producing Generation Ocean, which is our 360 film series. Um, it's fully immersive series. It brings uh, the audience kind of on research expeditions with the scientists that come on board our research vessel, Anjari. Um, and it gives the opportunity opportunity to the viewer to really be in on the action. Um, so our latest episode, uh, Generation Ocean Sharks, was just released last month, um, and it features Dr. Stephen Kajera and his team uh, at the Elasmo Lab, um, and it follows selective shark migration. So I think we're going to show a trailer now for the film, so enjoy. <laughs> What makes sharks so interesting is they're just plain cool. That's exciting to everyone from little kids to adults like me. For the past 10 years, I've been studying the migration of black tip sharks as they come down to South Florida. The next natural iteration of that is to look at the predators, the great hammerhead sharks. Sharks exert an influence throughout the entire ecosystem. This is why they're so important. Your, your film looks incredible. I mean, those images are unbelievable and Dr. Kajira, you're like a natural on the camera. So uh, I don't know where you learned that, <laughs> but uh, you're very good. Um, so right now we're going to ask the audience to start submitting their questions in the chat. And uh, we'll be asking our panelists as the evening continues your, your questions. But we're going to get started with just a couple questions here. Um, I think one of the biggest questions, Dr. Kajira, is 
what are the sharks doing down here? Like in this time of year, are they coming or are they going? Right. So what happens is uh, these sharks are basically following their preferred temperature. And so uh, in the wintertime, their preferred temperature happens to be down here in South Florida. And then in the spring, as the waters warm up, they just start to migrate uh, the way farther north. And uh, mating takes place in uh, the Carolinas and Georgia throughout the summertime. And that's where the females are giving birth to their pups as well. And then uh, by late summer, some of these sharks are moving as far north as uh, Long Island, New York. Um, And then they'll start, as the temperature starts to fall again, they'll start to move the way back down south again. And uh, by this time of year, we're getting a lot of sharks right off our our beaches here in South Florida. And they're going to be here for a month or two. And then uh, they'll start the whole trip uh, north again sometime around uh, March or April. Now, you've had a couple of years of research um, that showed that the shark numbers had gone down. Yeah. Has that, was that a hiccup, you think, or uh, what, what caused that? Sadly, no. Um, since starting this project, we have uh, over 10 years worth of data now looking at uh, abundance of these uh, black tip sharks down here in South Florida. And this is from the aerial survey work where we've done the exact same transect for over 10 years, um, multiple times throughout the, uh, the winter time and then also in the summer times. Uh, what we found is that the average water temperature in the winter here has increased dramatically by about uh, one and a half degrees Celsius in the past decade. So if the average water temperature keeps creeping up, the sharks are actually finding their preferred water temperature at higher and higher latitudes. You know, why, why bother swimming all the way down to Palm Beach if you encounter the preferred water temperature off, you know, Vero Beach, right? You know, save, save yourself 100 miles and just stop there. And that's what's happening. These sharks are not coming down here in nearly the same numbers that they did just a decade ago. And uh, the, the trend is very strong, highly significant, and... Uh, it's, you know, I was really hoping that this would be a really cold year and drive the sharks down here in big numbers. So I don't know, it's only mid-February. There's, maybe there's still a chance. Maybe that polar vortex is going to do something for us. You tell me. Yeah, well, we'll see, right? <laughs> it's in Texas right now. Um, Marianne, can you tell us more about the movements of these sharks and what sets them apart from other marine animals? Yeah, so... Um, if we think back to what everyone else here does, Steve thinks about where these animals go. Yanni thinks about why they go. Um, I think about how they go, how are they put together? And so one of the really cool things we've been able to discover in my lab recently was that sharks, we always think of them swimming as being this body that sort of wiggles and swims through the water. What we were able to show was the front half of the shark is wiggling differently from the back end of the shark. And so the front end and the back end are doing different things. And we were able to show this in two hammerhead species, including the the bonnet head that we can find here locally here in, in South Florida. And why this is interesting is it allows the shark to potentially be surveying and using its sensory system in the head and maybe eating, doing things that sharks need to do with their front end of their body, and allows the tail and the back half of the body to be undulating at a wavelength that supports swimming more. So this is um, one of the things we're continuing to look into. Another really fun aspect of my research is studying shark skin. So sharks we think of their skin as being an exotendon. So anyone who has ever worn compression tights after running, or if you've seen those full body swimsuits in the Olympics, people were swimming really fast and breaking all of the world records when they were wearing those swimsuits because they're really tight and they hold your body in. Um, I have been known to say shapewear for sharks (laughs) um, before. Um, So, you know, you have these full body swimsuits that basically reduce the jiggle in human bodies and help them swim faster. Sharks, their skin basically does the same thing. So it's an exotendon encapsulating their whole body that can really help them swim more efficiently. So while you're on the hot seat, uh, we have a um, question from the audience uh, for you, Marianne. Um, How are sharks able to swim in such shallow water? That's a great question. So um, basically, they're 
wiggling from side to side. So they're not moving up and down. So as long as their body can stay in the water, um, they want to keep their gills covered, for example, um, they're moving side to side. So if they're in a, a, a depth of water, they can basically be moving through there and get, get rather shallow. And you may have seen videos of some of these black tips and hammerheads coming right close to the shore. And you can actually see their dorsal fins sticking out of the water. So they're, they're really quite shallow. And um, just the way their body undulates, I think allows them to go much shallower than, than other animals would. You, you might think of things that you've seen like orcas breaching on the, on the shore or something. <laughs> um, you know, they have to wiggle to get off the shore and, you know, sharks, the way they're moving their body isn't, they don't need more depth to be able to do that. So that might, might be what helps them technically swim so close to shore. Why they do that might be a, a better question for Steve or Yanni. Okay, well, Yanni, can you answer, um, are people shocked when they see how close the sharks get to swimmers without any kind of incident happening? I think they are. And obviously, you know, Steve has been working on the system for a lot longer, but, you know, these sharks have been there for, for you know, probably as long as, as, as we have. The, the big difference now is that everybody has drones, right? So before, the only way you would get this sort of aerial view was if you were flying a plane and not that many people are, are flying planes up there, um, at least looking for sharks. But now with drones, everyone suddenly realizes there's all these sharks out there. <laughs> and we'll still go out and we'll work right off, you know, the, the shores looking for these animals. And you can see people who are oblivious that these animals are there. Um, and the other thing I hear is, you know, if, if people knew they were there, should they be scared? And I think really, um, they don't need to be scared, uh, especially with these species. I mean, uh, one thing is we can see with these black ticks, for example, is they're very, very shy sharks. So despite the very large numbers you're seeing in the water, if you try to get in the water to see them, you probably won't see anything. In fact, it's very rare to see uh, these black tips if you're diving or swimming around because they just want to uh, avoid you. So uh, for the most part, you know, you don't have to uh, be, be concerned, at least with, with these species of sharks. But I still think people uh, get a shock when they realize how many sharks we do have in shallow waters, especially with the sort of large urbanized environment that a lot of South Florida is. Yeah. Well, there we have an audience question for you, Yanni. Um, when tagging sharks in the water, do you use scuba or some other method? So um, when we are doing the tagging underwater, uh, which again, we don't normally do because for most species, it won't work. They won't let you get close enough. There are a few species that we can uh, get away with that. And actually free diving is probably the best way to do it um, because you're more mobile uh, and also things like the bubbles don't uh, scare them as much. Um, one other tool I like to use are closed circuit rebreathers, which are kind of like uh, open circuit scuba, but rather than breathing out your bubbles, it recirculates it. So there's no bubbles. Um, so you're, you're pretty much silent, but they're also pretty cumbersome pieces of equipment. So you're not very mobile. So generally the best in water method, if you're gonna be doing that is, is free diving. Great. Um, so it sounds like you guys are using so many different methods to look at what the sharks are doing now. Um, for example, there's a lot of drone work. You mentioned that just now, Yanni. Marianne, you're able to collect some incredibly useful footage. Uh, what have you learned from the drone footage you've collected? And I think you did explain that a little bit more, but can you go into some detail? Yeah, so we... We often study swimming in the lab, like I said, and these black tips present a really amazing opportunity to see if the sharks that we have in the lab are representative of what is happening in the actual ocean, because it's, it's all well and good to do these experiments in the lab, and we learn a lot from lab science, but to be able to see if this is actually the same thing happening in the wild is really powerful. And one of the things we were able to show very recently, just last year, the publication came out, was we were able to show the black tip sharks also move their head and move their back end a little bit differently. And, you know, this is exciting because um, unless you study fish swimming, most of us don't think of fish swimming in this way. And in fact, a lot of fish don't. So this is something pretty new that we've been starting to talk about and show 
that it might be pretty common in sharks. And these black tips were an excellent way to look at this. Um, another really great thing we've been able to look at with the drones with regard to um, how they actually swim, the mechanics of it is in the lab, we often study animals swimming to, by themselves. But one of the exciting things about the shark migration and this, these big aggregations are we see the sharks together. And so now we're able to start to look at how the swimming changes when you're in a big group. So if you imagine like a, a, a flock of ibises taking off and you see them all flying together, there's some pretty coordinated movement there. So they have to coordinate that, but then the mechanics of the actual um, swimming or flying have to be able to facilitate moving in a large group. So the best analogy um, we've all probably experienced for this is walking in a, in a large crowd. So you're walking around at Disney, you're walking around after a Dolphins game, all pre-COVID, right? We can't do that very much right now. <laughs> but when you are walking around in large crowds, your walking is really mitigated by the speed of the people walking around you, right? So even if you want to walk fast at Disney, sometimes you're just not going to. You're going to be walking really slow. And that might change how long your steps are or how fast your steps are. Um, and the same thing can happen with these sharks. So we're using the drones to really study how the sharks at the front of the group are swimming compared to the sharks at the back of the group. And um, if there's a gradient from the front of the group to the back of the group. And the last thing we've been really exploring is what happens when one of these predators come in. So we've got some really great footage from the drone of these hammerhead sharks coming into the black tip aggregations. And so now we're able to study the black tip shark swimming, the black tip shark swimming in groups, and we're able to study how this big predator is swimming. And one of the most exciting things I think about the hammerhead for me is, um, remember at the beginning, I was telling you I was studying bonnet heads and these little hammerheads. They were the babies of this species. I can't bring the big hammerheads into the lab. They're just, <laughs> they're too big. The tanks at Gumbo are not big enough. And so now I'm able to look at how these actually swim as adults using the drone, which is very exciting. Great. So Stephen, we've got a, a couple questions here for you. Um, how far south do the black tips go and do they go to the Caribbean or is that a separate population of black tips? Right. So the black tips on the eastern seaboard of the U.S. that migrate down here, they stop around uh, South Florida. They uh, actually stop in about Palm Beach County. Um, and this is the southern terminus of their migration. Hmm. Um, and then they'll stay here. And then, like I said, they'll, they'll move farther north. And the ones over in the, uh, the Bahamas, for example, there have been black tips tagged in, in Bimini. Um, that's not very far away, but we've had pretty much zero transfer of those animals coming this way or our animals going over there. Uh, so of the, you know, 100 plus whatever, however many sharks we've tagged now, um, I think only one has ever been reported. One of our sharks has ever been reported over in the Bahamas. So uh, they seem to be basically very distinct. And, and going along with that, the population of black tips in the Gulf of Mexico on the other side of Florida, the west coast of Florida, that is a distinct population from the black tips on, on our side as well. And there's uh, not only movement work that looks at that, but also genetics work that shows that the populations are genetically separate on either side of the Florida Peninsula as well. So um, some, some interesting stuff is happening out there with the movements of these animals. And we have to be careful that we don't overgeneralize and say black tips do this when we're referring specifically to the, you know, the eastern seaboard population of, uh, of black tips here in the U.S. And it doesn't necessarily mean that all black tips are going to uh, do the same thing. So now you use a small plane uh, to see how many there are out there. Tell us how that works as far as like photography goes and how the plane is be better or different than the drones. Right. So um, like, uh, like Dr. Porter was saying, the drones are great because you can just hover there and you can park it and look straight down and watch the animal swim underneath. Uh, airplanes, you can't just stop. You keep moving. Um, and so with the planes, what we're able to do is I, I cover the whole tri-county area. I fly from Miami up to Jupiter. So Miami-Dade, Broward, Palm Beach, I cover all three of those in, in one 
uh, transect. And what we do is we mount a high definition uh, 4K video camera out the window of the uh, pilot side and basically just hit record. And so I don't have to do anything. I just fly the plane. And the, uh, the camera records uh, the, the whole transect from, the, from about the shoreline to about 200 meters offshore. So think of that as two football field banks, right? You know, football field's 100 yards, so about two football field banks offshore. And that's what we're, we're uh, following from the beach all the way up. And uh, what we do then is we take that video back to the lab, and then we go through it. And we carefully count, you know, on the computer. We download the video onto the computer, and we carefully count how many sharks did we see between, uh, 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 you know, Palm Beach Inlet and Jupiter Inlet. And, you know, how many did we see between Boynton Inlet and Palm Beach Inlet and, and, and et cetera. And so we're able to see how many sharks there were, where they were distributed. And by doing this uh, over time, we're able to look at uh, uh, the temporal displacement of these animals. We see a lot in the wintertime and then hardly any in the, the, you know, the rest of the year, which indicates that they've, they've all left and gone north after that. Okay, so I have, a, I have a silly question that I'm asking. And then, Carrie, we have a serious question from the audience. There was a um, TV photographer out today on Singer Island trying to capture um, spinner sharks, which we, is that the same thing as a black tip? And why do they jump and spin? Right. <laughs> So the, these are actually two different species, uh, black tips, Carcharhinus limbatus, and, and spinners, uh, Carcharhinus berberpina. Um, they look superficially very similar. And they both have this sort of behavior where they jump out of the water, spin around in the air, and then splash back down again. And so when people see that, they say, oh, that's a spinner shark. But it's probably a black tip. And in fact, down here, when we've been fishing and catching all these uh, sharks, we see them jumping all around the boat. We catch them, they're all black tips, 100% black tips. We've never caught a spinner here. Hmm. Um, spinners are probably a little bit farther north, maybe a little bit farther offshore as well. We're simply not, they're not the ones that are hanging out close to the beach. Uh, but because the black tips jump and spin in the air, people get those two uh, confused all the time. Um, and then uh, the second part of your question was what I... I what, uh, why do they spin? Why do they why jump do out they of the water? Uh, I should push that one off onto Yanni. Um, he, Yanni answered it one time for me, but I don't think he remembers. <laughs> what he said. Uh, you know, there's, <laughs> I could offer some explanations, but I don't know if they're correct. You Here's told me it was because they're happy. Correct mine, Yanni, go for it. <laughs> I don't think that was me telling you that was because they're okay. happy. I don't, I don't remember saying that. I mean, again, you know, the, the um, we we see several species of sharks doing this breaching, not in the same way, not necessarily spinning, but launching themselves out of the water. There's a wide uh, range of species. Most famous is, is the white sharks. Um, and there'll be different reasons. For Sometimes it may be related to foraging or, and hunting, um, but other times it's clearly not related to that. You even see basking sharks, which are a huge species of shark that eats plankton, and they will amazingly breach sometimes. Um, so one other thing we've heard, uh, one potential reason is, is maybe to dislodge parasites. That's something I've heard. Um, but I, I don't know of any good explanation um, that anyone has conclusively been able to say why they do that. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Carrie, okay, we have a audience question here. We heard about some of the challenges that scientists face. What challenges are there in trying to capture this work through film? What underwater film equipment is required to make a 360 film? Oh, man. Um, <laughs> uh, that's a loaded question. Um, it's filmmaking, so it's always challenging, right? Um, the, the thing about this film in particular was that um, tagging sharks is kind of a spontaneous thing. Um, you don't know if you're going to, what you're going to bring in. So you always have to be ready to go to capture the footage. Um, and uh, in 360, um, the camera is always capturing everything all around it. So you have to choreograph and be prepared and make sure everybody is aware of where the camera is and what they're doing and how they're interacting with the camera. Um, if you think about it in terms of, um, like theater in the round, for example, uh, everything is um, in motion and uh, the viewer you try when you're cutting it in an editorial, you're trying to get the viewer to look at specific things, um, uh, big events, big story beats, um, but you can't always guarantee that that's gonna happen. So you have to be aware of everything that's happening all around you. Um, 
And then, you know, in terms of equipment, we used, uh, we purposefully used the same equipment uh, that these researchers use. Uh, you know, they, they use the equipment to tell them the story of what's going on with the animals they're studying. And so we wanted to use their equipment in the same way, except for with a 360 camera. So we use block cams, we captured aerial footage, we use drones, all with 360 cameras uh, to tell our story and hope hopefully the viewer will feel that they are getting perspective uh, from the lens uh, what, for example, Stephen would see after he comes back from a flight um, and uh, understand kind of what his perspective is and, and uh, kind of see uh, everything as a whole um, within the story. Great, thank you. Okay, so Stuart has a question um, and he's not addressing this to anyone in particular. Um, he says, we know hammerheads are preying on black tips, but do we know if other species like tiger sharks are as well? It's open for anybody. <laughs> Go for it, Yanni. Well, I'll just say, I mean, tigers certainly include sharks in their diet. Uh, and uh, we've uh, Definitely seen confirmed cases of tiger sharks taking similar sized reef sharks, like gray reef sharks, for example. Uh, I, I don't know if there's any specific example for black tips, and maybe Steve does, but I would certainly imagine that, that they have done. Yeah, I, I don't know that we have that documented, but uh, just anecdotally, people will tell us that, oh yeah, the big tigers are um, also munching on the, uh, on the black tips. So I'm I, I would imagine it happens with the big tigers, maybe some of the big bulls as well. Um, and uh, I, uh, I simply haven't seen it myself, but uh, I believe it happens. Yanni, here's a question for you uh, from Gregory. He asked, do sharks follow a leader in their groups? That's a very good question. And um, it's not one I could answer right now. Um, you know, it's something we're really interested in is, is the role of leadership. And obviously leadership is, is something that has been quite well studied in, in other animal groups, uh, birds, uh, mammals like baboons, things like that. Um, but we, we don't have the um, data to fully answer that uh, with, with sharks yet. And, and you know, Marianne's probably going to be the closest or, or the first one to answer it for black tips. Uh, the problem has been is that for most other animals, you can simultaneously track all individuals in a group. So you can go and put uh, GPS loggers on all your baboons and track the whole troop. Uh, we really can't do that with sharks. I mean, even Steve's putting out all these, these tags, you're not able to tag the 10, 20 immediately that are in a group together at that moment. So I think the, the best way to answer that is, is going to be um, the drone method that um, Marianne is using. Um, but I, I don't have an answer for you right now. Yeah. Yeah, we, we are seeing from the drones um, differences in how the, the front or the leader of the group swims compared to the back. So um, mechanically, we're starting to see that there, there are differences um, from the front to the back of the group. And uh, that data isn't published yet, but will hopefully be this year. Um, but we, we are seeing evidence that there, there, is a, there is a leader and the leader swims differently from the rest. And and the leader also responds differently, mechanically speaking, in terms of how fast they're swimming and what they're doing um, to a predator than sharks in the group that are further away from the predator. Great, well, Marianne, since you're in the hot seat, um, Christy asks if there are any changes in shark movements when they are chasing and when they are relaxed, except swimming generally faster. Right, so that's a great question. and. In the black tips, when they're being chased by the hammerhead, we've seen clear differences in how they're swimming in terms of how fast they're moving their tail, their speed, and um, their body is less wiggly when they're swimming faster. They kind of stiffen up. Remember sort of that, that exo tendon, that swimsuit that makes your whole body stiffer. Um, so we're seeing that when they swim faster. In our drone footage of the hammerheads, the hammerheads, even though it looks like they're swimming faster and chasing the black tips, their speed doesn't change. And we haven't been able to, they maneuver more, but they haven't really changed their speed and, and a lot about their straight swimming. So 
so far, what we think we have gotten is um, not necessarily a predation event per se, but it's more the hammerheads toying with the black tips. Um, you know, the way your your puppy or your cat might pounce on a toy, right? It seems like the hammerhead, it, we know they eat black tips. We know they can catch them. But in the video we have seen um, and that we have analyzed, we haven't analyzed a hammerhead actually actively catching the back the black tip so so far it looks like we've we've caught them frightening the black tips enough to elicit a response from the black tips but the hammerhead itself hasn't really pushed it into high gear yet ah, that's so interesting um okay so here's a question i think this is for steven but it's open to anybody um what are the black tips feeding on wall here it doesn't seem like there is sufficient prey to support such a large aggregation. Do black tip and bull sharks eat the same diet? One of the things we've been looking at in the last couple of years is uh, the, the little bait fish, the little prey fish that are uh, close to shore. And, and you're right, when you have literally thousands of these top level predators sweeping down here every winter and spending a couple of months here, they're going to have a, a major impact on the local ecosystem. What we found by using uh, block cams, it's just a block cam is just a GoPro on a concrete block and you lower it over and it just films whatever uh, swims by. We're able to look at not only shark abundance that way, but also the abundance of the little fish that they're, they're preying on. And uh, what we found from our data so far is that um, peak uh, prey fish abundance and diversity is highest in about January. When the, you know, just before the sharks get here. And then by the time the sharks leave in April, it's crashed to pretty much nothing. And then it takes a year for that, the, the numbers of bait fish to build up again uh, for, the, uh, you know, for the sharks to arrive next year again. So these sharks are having uh, an influence on the local ecosystem. Um, they are certainly preying on a lot of the same uh, small fishes that other, other uh, uh, sharks around here are preying on. Um, but, uh, you know, what effect that's going to have, especially going forward as we're getting fewer and fewer black tips coming down here, right? You're not having, you know, tens of thousands sweeping down here anymore. You're getting, you know, maybe a couple thousand or maybe in the hundreds, you know, this could have large effects on the, uh, the local reef fish population. And that might have, you know, cascading effects throughout the entire uh, food web. We, we, simply, we simply don't know, but it's going to be something that would be very interesting to look at, you know, going forward. Here's a question for um, Stephen or Yanni. Do sharks take advantage of water currents to expend less energy when they swim? Um, yeah, that's actually something we, we have um, uh, some data we've been trying to uh, publish right now. Um, and uh, the answer is yes. Uh, uh, in there's sort of two things you can do with water currents. You can either go with the current and and not swim and just let it take you somewhere, which is which is good unless it takes you somewhere you don't want to go. Or the advantage that a lot of these sharks might have is that they can kind of uh, look for areas where you might have updrafts, which is very similar to what happened with winds. So when winds hit a mountain, you get updrafts, and you'll see all these birds that use that. You see birds soaring above, having to not really beat their wings at all, and they're able to fly. Um, and so when you keep in mind that most of these sharks are negatively buoyant, uh, you basically have a very similar situation where they use their pectoral fins, which are kind of like the wings of a plane, and they can ride these updrafts. So um, that may, you know, we don't know how often that happens. It may be in, in you know, certain environments only because you have to get a, a, an updraft generated, which is when a current hits a slope. Um, but we are starting to see some pretty good evidence that they can use uh, certain current situations to reduce how much energy they, they uh, use. I'll just uh, jump in real quick on just to add that um, when we started our, our uh, looking at the migration of these black tips uh, going north, one of the ideas was they might be jumping on the Gulf Stream and, and catching a ride, you know, getting a free lift as, on their way north. What we found, uh, surprisingly, was from our telemetry data, from our, our satellite tags, these sharks, at least the ones that we're reporting, were not doing that. They were basically hugging the shoreline and swimming their way north, very, uh, you know, the, the brute force way of doing things instead of the, uh, the lazy way. But uh, when it comes to swimming efficiency, you know, it's not my area. That's uh, more of a, a Marianne question. So maybe she can address 
you know, what the, the energetic value would be of, of not doing that. I mean, did you want to address that at all? Just sharks <laughs> using, <laughs> sharks not using the current at all the, to help out about the energetics, but if you're able to jump in just like us, right. If you're at the beach and you get caught in the riptide, the riptide's going to take you where the riptide wants to take you. And if you want to swim against it, you're going to expend a lot of energy and you're going to have to work really hard. So you're probably going to be stroking and kicking faster. And if a shark were to swim against the current, you would probably see its body movements change to indicate that it was also trying to work faster and it would definitely burn more energy that way for sure. Go okay. with the flow. It's yeah. always the best way. <laughs> I've right, got another question for you, Marianne. Um, have you, okay, and this is from someone who knows what they're talking about because I can't even probably pronounce this word. Have you studied how the bacoid shape of scales decreases their friction moving through the water and it's spelled P-L-A-C-O-I-D? Very good, Kim. Nice. So the placoid <laughs> scales are um, basically the dermal denticles. They're the little teeth that are, on sharks. So if you've ever touched a shark in a touch tank in an aquarium, um, they feel like sandpaper, right? And um, I don't research this, but other researchers have found that the shape of the scales and where they're placed and kind of the density that they're placed can impact water flow really close to the body of the shark. And um, in certain species, that allows basically the shark's body to move against the water um, in, a, in a different way that helps the shark swim faster. Huh. Okay, Carrie, I have a question for you. Um, do you have any recommendations for someone who studied science in school, hoping to move into more of a SCICOM type role? I think that's science communication? Yeah. Um, do I have advice? Uh, well, I, I think there's, uh, different roles in filmmaking that you should first figure out, uh, kind of what you're most excited about creatively speaking. So directing, producing, writing, um, I mean, there are just many different, uh, entry points into the industry. Um, for those who science, who studied science, um, I think writing, um, might be a great approach, um, because those other things you can learn, like the technical skills as you go. Um, and, uh, there are a lot of nonprofit out there. There are a lot of uh, schools out there who are looking for people who can uh, tell the stories of the scientists um, in a clear way uh, that is accessible to the public. Um, and that might be a great entry point for you. Um, I, I think that you just have to do your research and uh, speak to these people and uh, get comfortable interviewing and uh, learning. Um, if you're studying science, you're probably already comfortable with that. Um, but yeah, I guess. What's, um, what's the biggest challenge in, I guess, connecting people to the science when you're doing these films? Is it getting the footage? Is it getting the right interviews? Um, editing? Yeah. <laughs> well, it depends what type of film you're making, of course. Um, I think that the biggest challenge is to actually tell the science accurately and to be credible, um, uh, you know, which is something that Anjari purposefully tries to, like we, we pride ourselves on, on being credible and we have scientists who work at the organization who, who work with these researchers and uh, guide me through the film pro making process. Um, from, uh, to make it compelling, I personally find that an emotional story, a story where we understand the person's background and what drives them to do what they do, is usually uh, the best way to connect. And then from there, you could teach um, and educate. So that's my, my personal approach to it. Great. Thank you. I just want to remind the audience to send in your questions. We have several, so we're not at a shortage. But um, if you have anything, you know, feel free to ask. One of the questions here, this is probably for Stephen. Um, are there black tips here year round or do they all leave, you know, in the summertime? There are certainly uh, much greater numbers of, of sharks here uh, in the wintertime as these huge numbers of black tips come down here and spend the winter in South Florida. Um, but even after they leave, there are still a few stragglers uh, who will stay here year round. And that's something that we are actually wanting to start to look at 
uh, we wanted to do it last year, but COVID kind of shut down all our field work. But we wanted to start tagging these black tips who were here in the summertime uh, to see where they were going. You know, what what are they doing? What are they? Why are they here? Um, and uh, what what their movements are and how those are different than the uh, you know these these big masses of sharks that come down here. So yes, there are a few that are always here. Um, but uh, it's I'm not sure how they're different from this uh, this uh, population that comes sweeping down here in, in huge numbers every winter. Hmm. Stay tuned. They're, we'll, yeah, they're the resident sharks. They're not like the snowbirds. Yeah, they're the resident <laughs> rather than the snowbirds. Exactly. Um, okay, this is an interesting question. I never even thought about this. This is for who, whoever wants to answer. Are sharks impacted by storms? I'm guessing hurricanes, maybe nor'easters. Uh, do they swim deeper? Well, if no one's going to take it, I'll jump. <laughs> um, there was a paper, oh, maybe a decade ago now, maybe more, where they actually had a bunch of uh, little baby black tips instrumented with uh, acoustic transmitters in, I think it was Terracia Bay on the other side of the west coast of Florida. And they found that when a, there was a, a tropical storm approached and barometric pressures dropped, all the sharks left. They left the bay. They went out into deeper water and they didn't come back for, you know, till after the storm was over, um, you know, things had sort of settled down and that's when the sharks came back. So there's good evidence that these sharks are able to sense these changes in atmospheric pressure, respond to them and say, a big storm is coming. I'm going to go deep. Uh, I'm not going to get tossed around in the shallows here. Um, and so that, that has been documented, at least for these little juvenile black tips. And uh, I'd imagine the same principle holds for, you know, big things like hurricanes and, uh, you know, sharks basically going deeper to uh, to stay out of the way. They also recently uh, documented it for juvenile bull sharks in the Everglades. So mm -hmm. when I can't remember which storm it was, it was Irma or one of the other ones, but just before the storm hit, everybody stopped being detected. All the tagged sharks suddenly were not detected anymore. So mm -hmm. it, it's uh, probably quite a common response. They all evacuated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay, a good question. I think we lost Kim. Um, I don't have access to the questions, but <laughs> um, uh, tell us more about uh, research in the Everglades. <laughs> I don't. I don't work. I, I haven't worked in the Everglades in quite a while. In fact, when I when I was working there, I was studying sawfish, which is uh, a relative of a shark. It's actually a, a type of ray. It looks like a shark with a chainsaw on its nose, but um, uh, pretty impressive animal um, and and closely related to to uh, to uh, sharks. But uh, I've only uh, just started working back in the Everglades again. How did how did all three of you start? Like, what was your excitement to start studying sharks to begin with? Do you want to answer first? Stephen, go for it. Oh, um, I I was always interested. You know, since I was a little kid, I remember, you know, I was five years old watching Jacques Cousteau specials and thinking, "Wow, this is so cool!" And so that's what I wanted to do, and I just ended up doing it, which is so, you know, it, it's amazing. I'm, I'm delighted. I'm, I'm doing exactly what I always wanted to do. Did I just leave? My internet went down. Was I offline? Did anyone notice me being yes. gone? Yes, Kim, I, I jumped <laughs> in and I asked uh, what was everybody's excitement to get into studying sharks to begin with. Um, oh, good. I'm so sorry. I have no idea what happened. <laughs> that's okay. Well, do we want to answer the question? Then we can go on to your other questions, Kim. Yeah. Is that okay? Yep, yep. <laughs> Marianne, do you want to take it? Yeah. Um, so like Steve, I kind of grew up reading National Geographic magazines, and I thought it would be really amazing to you know, be a scientist. I didn't know what that meant as a kid because I didn't have other scientists in my family and had never really seen a scientist outside of National Geographic. But I grew up as a competitive swimmer, and if you can't tell, I can talk about swimming pretty much all the time. So to be able to realize there was a career that would allow me to talk about swimming all the time in 
really awesome animals that swim way better than humans, obviously, that sounded like a great job and a great opportunity to me. Very cool. Annie? It was actually, uh, I think it was a, a National Geographic documentary from early 80s with, or maybe even late 70s with Eugenie Clark. I remember being in it, uh, Valerie Taylor. It's a pretty famous one at the time. There weren't that many documentaries on sharks around. And um, I had the VHS. It was early, probably early 80s, mid 80s. Um, but uh, I just watched that thing uh, so many times and that really got me interested. And then, and then the other thing that also kind of, got me interested was Jaws. I, Jaws was an incredible film and I actually thought Hooper, the scientist, was was actually a pretty cool character. So those those are two of the things I remember uh, driving my interest early on. I want to second your Jaws uh, thing. I was asked in film school, uh, what is a movie that made me uh, feel something or, or like really struck me? And I was like, Jaws. Like, who you you took this animal and you made it into this character and it just it everybody knows of it and talks about it and um sorry just just agreeing with you <laughs> back to you kim okay i was going to say that's so interesting that you mentioned jaws because i know um you know people have scientists especially have tried to get away from that uh, idea of the man-eating shark. And so just the fact that it got you interested is 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 pretty cool, um, even though that we know that's not necessarily, uh, there's no jaws out there going to eat us. Oh, well. Yeah, I just, I admired it for also as a film. As, I mean, it's a monster film. It was not, you know, that's what it was meant to be, right? Same as a film about giant spiders um, and just a very, very well done film. So unfortunately, <laughs> it led to some, you know, uh, negative uh, consequences with human behavior, but uh, I, I don't really blame the film for that. Yeah. Okay, here is a question for um, Stephen or Yanni. Are you using acoustic tags to take advantage of the fact of the FACT receiver network along the East Coast to track movements of individual sharks? Yes, actually, uh, the, the, the fact network is this uh, array of uh, acoustic receivers, these are little listening stations that are anchored on the seafloor all along the, uh, the coast here. And uh, it's great because um, researchers will have a little section of coast. We have like a half a dozen receivers in, you know, from in, in Palm Beach County, for example, that cover our basic area. And anytime any animal is detected, whether it's ours or someone else's, all of those data, all of those detections are uploaded to a centralized node. And so whoever owns that transmitter can query it and say, oh, my, my snook that I tagged off, you know, Fort Pierce is detected off Boca Raton or something, right? And so all the researchers share their data together uh, in this fact network. And uh, it's, it's a great collaborative uh, way to um, leverage your, your individual uh, array of receivers with all these other receivers covering a much broader area and... Uh, it's a, it's, a great, uh, it's a great tool for uh, scientists studying these long distance movements. Yeah, I use the fact, I never even heard of that before. So these are, we've got some good audience. They know what they're talking about. <laughs> yeah, we, I use it, we use it as well, not just for sharks. So we have some uh, work tracking Goliath grouper, for example. And, and uh, the thing to remember is that, that the problem with acoustic tracking is you only know where an animal is if you have a receiver there. It's not like satellite tracking. If you have no receivers there, then you're not going to detect it, even if it's if it's there. Um, and you know, receivers are expensive. Uh, so, by everybody collaborating, we vastly increase the area uh, over which we have coverage. So it's really very beneficial for all the all the users uh, in Florida who are involved with uh, acoustic tracking. Okay, this is just for everyone, so we can just maybe go down. Um for each person, which species of shark is most intriguing to you overall in your respective fields? And can you share with us something you discovered recently about a shark species that surprised or excited you? I can tell you about my favorite shark. Okay. <laughs> um, my favorite shark is the mako because they are the fastest swimmers. And one of the things I found out that um, I found this out at the very beginning of my dissertation. So in the, you know, mid to late 2000s, um, which is a really long time ago now, um, 
I thought Makos are the fastest swimming shark. Their whole body needs to be really stiff. And even both their backbone will be really stiff. But when I tested their individual vertebrae to see how they kind of stacked up against other species, the Mako's backbone was really wimpy when you just look at the vertebrae. But the thing that I observed about them, and I haven't been able to measure this, but when you cut between the vertebrae, so the joint between the vertebrae, it's highly pressurized and it'll actually squirt out at you, the fluid in there, in this oh capsule. It's like a water balloon between the bones and it's highly pressurized. And when you cut through it, all the fluid in there squirts out. And so it's really cool because it seems like their joints might be actually stiffer than their bones, which is something I've been kind of exploring because remember sharks don't actually have bones they have mineralized cartilage a skeleton so it is possible that their skeleton might flex more than their joints in a mako which i think is super neat and that's um one thing i've observed and i will answer that question before i retire i promise <laughs> that's great um for me it's um the oceanic white tip which is an open ocean species that um, I just admire them because they live in open ocean where there's very little uh, food and, and making a living is very challenging. And uh, they're just a very cool shark. I mean, if you're in the water with them, they just seem very, very uh, confident. I find them, uh, I don't know, there's just something intriguing about them. Uh, followed close second by uh, scalloped hammerheads, which I've always been amazed with, particularly because of the, uh, the huge social groups that they form, which we feel, still don't really understand why they do that. Uh, in terms of discoveries, I'd probably say a, a few years ago, uh, my colleagues and I uh, were able to show that bonnethead sharks, which we always knew that bonnetheads would have seagrass in their stomachs, which we assumed they had, you know, was incidental when they would scoop up blue crabs. They like to eat crabs and they might just scoop up seagrass. Um, but we figured, you know, being carnivores that they couldn't digest it. But a few years ago, we were able to show that bonnetheads can digest seagrass. Doesn't mean they're not uh, picking it up incidentally, but they are now basically, we can call them omnivorous because they're able to get energy and actually digest uh, seagrass. So I think that was surprising that we were able to, to show that there was an omnivorous shark. I guess I'm going to have to uh, agree with Yanni. One of my favorite sharks has got to be the hammerheads. Um, just because you've got such an unusual head shape, you don't see that anywhere else in the vertebrate kingdom. Um, and you can ask so many good evolutionary questions. You know, why the weird head? What, what advantage does that have? And my, my training, my background is actually in, as a sensory physiologist, looking at the, uh, how the sharks use their, their different sensory systems to uh, inform them about the world around them. And with the hammerheads, because their head is so unusually shaped, their sensors are distributed very differently than a more conventionally shaped uh, pointed nose shark. And so I think you can ask some really fun questions about uh, hammerheads to see, you know, why? Why the weird head and, and how is it advantageous? And so some of the things that we've looked at have been things like uh, visual fields, you know, uh, with the eyes stuck way off on the ends of this big giant head, uh, you know, are they, what are they able to see? Do they have a big blind spot in front of them or is, you know, what, what's happening? It turns out that they actually have very good binocular overlap of the left and right visual fields in front of them. So they actually have better uh, binocular convergence in front of their head than a more conventionally shaped pointy nose shark, which was, uh, which was a surprise. I thought my student was wrong. I said, no, you can't be right, Mickey. That's got to be wrong. Um, but no, she showed me the data. And sure enough, the hammerheads actually have a very broad visual field. And they actually have more like a 30 degree overlap of left and right visual fields versus only about a 10 degree overlap in a more conventionally shaped shark. So interesting stuff you can uh, ask about the, uh, the hammerheads and, and why the weird head. I, well, I have a quick hammerhead question. I had heard that they're uh, more vulnerable um, to... I guess being hurt, I know that's not scientific, uh, when you're fishing, like beach-based fishing or just shark fishing in general, is that true? And if so, why? Uh, I'll answer a little bit, then I'm going to have to turn it over to uh, Marianne and Yanni to answer the rest. Um, but briefly, we know that 
uh, these hammerheads, you can think of them as high performance little sports cars. They don't like to stop. Um, and when they are uh, stressed on a line, they are, you know, basically fighting for a while and they get tired very quickly. Uh, they're not well adapted to, uh, you know, that sort of fight. And, and they're not, not a strong shark in that sense. They're not like a bull shark or something that can just fight forever. Um, and so they, they basically tire out. And I think that probably has to do with their, their, their swimming. Um, but that's, that's beyond my ability to, uh, to answer. I'm going to turn over to these guys. They can pick up better than I can. Yeah, I mean, they, they, are, they are definitely, of all the species of hammerheads, are, are, you know, generally known to be much more fragile than some of the other species. So tiger sharks, for example, are very hardy species. But uh, hammerheads, you have to be very quick with working up. Uh, because you know they, it can, uh, they don't do well if they stay on the lines for a long time. And uh, the specific reasons, you know, just one thing to add is they also have pretty high metabolic rates compared to some similar other s size sharks, and that also means that they need to extract oxygen at a at a faster rate from the water. And so when they're when they're not able to swim properly, um, that may uh, cause them physiological issues quite rapidly. Great. Um, well, here's a question for you, Yanni. Um, do you need to use anesthetics to place transmitters or monitors on sharks? That's a good question. Uh, and for the most part, no, because we're able to take advantage of a sort of a, a natural anesthetic. And that is when you turn them on their back, they kind of go into a, a catatonic state called tonic immobility. Um, not entirely sure why, but it might be the, the weight putting pressure on a nerve. But they kind of go into this uh, state, and that allows us to work them up very rapidly. Um, so for the most part, we don't use anesthesia. Uh, we may with some of the smaller ones where we can bring them on board and then um, give them an anesthetic. But for the most part, you, you know, we can take advantage of this uh, catatonic state to uh, work them up um, quickly and, and you know, just as importantly, safely for the shark. Stephen, do you use the same method where you put them upside down? Yeah, we do the, uh, the same thing. When we're uh, dealing with the sharks, we try and keep them in the water as much as possible, keep their gills covered, and like uh, Yanni was saying, work them up as quickly as possible. So trying to add things like chemicals into the ocean, it's not going to work. Uh, you know, scientists have been using tonic immobility for decades, and it's uh, a well-known, well-proven technique for quickly anesthetizing, you know, so-called anesthetizing the animal allowing you to uh, even do little minor surgeries, make a little incision in the belly, mm -hmm. stick the transmitter and suture them back up again. And the shark is just sitting there motionless the whole time. Then as soon as you flip them right side up, they wake up and, and off they go. So it's, uh, it's a great technique that uh, has been well used for, for a long time. Okay, we have a question from Valerie. Um, Valerie would like to know, and this is just directed to everyone, Valerie would like to know how much we know about black tips, reproduction time, uh, period, and mating behavior. I can jump in briefly. We know that uh, the, the population of black tips here on the, uh, on the eastern seaboard, um, the females will give birth in around May or June in shallow coastal estuaries in uh, Georgia and the Carolinas. Um, and then they'll take a year off. They won't reproduce for another year. And then when they do reproduce the following year, they'll mate around, you know, May or June. Uh, they'll just stay for about 11 months or so, and they'll give birth to about four to six pups. And so they have a, what's called a biennial reproductive cycle. They reproduce one year, and they take a year off. They reproduce the next year, and they take a year off. Um, and uh, we know that mating and, and birthing take place in the summertime. And then uh, they, uh, I guess... They eat a lot the rest of the year. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, Stephen, I think you kind of had already addressed this, but maybe um, you could go over a little bit again. Um, what are the ecological consequences, if we know, of less black tip sharks migrating to South Florida? And it's going to throw off the food chains in the area. So if you have an annual influx of thousands of these top level predators coming down here, they are going to exert an influence. They're going to have an impact on the local ecosystem. They're going to eat a lot of little bait fish around here. 
um, and, and we see these reductions in bait fish numbers. Uh, and if you get fewer and fewer of these sharks coming down, you're not going to have that annual, you know, spring cleaning of the, uh, of the reef, right? You're not going to have, you know, huge numbers of sharks coming down and, and eating a lot of these little bait fish. And as a result, you might have a lot more bait fish persisting for a lot longer uh, throughout the year. And they might be eating, you know, smaller fish or, or zooplankton or something and uh, drive those numbers down. Uh, which might cause the phytoplankton numbers to increase. You might end up with, you know, murkier water, more turbid water as a result of uh, more phytoplankton. Um, you know, I'm, this is beyond my, my area of expertise. I might push this off onto uh, Marianne, who trained as an ecologist, or Yanni, who's done more of this sort of stuff than I have. But, <laughs> um, you know, you have these, these cascading effects. You know, knocking out one level can cause the level underneath to explode, which could you know, as a result, knock out the level underneath them, you know, so knocking out these top level predators can have multiple effects on, on multiple levels throughout the, uh, the food pyramid. Either of you are guys, the guys, excuse me, either of you other guys want to weigh in on something like that? Well, I, I guess I'd add that that's, I think that's probably true for the black tips here, because this is kind of a unique situation where you have a difference in 10,000 predators seasonally, and that, that is pretty dramatic. Um, but as a general question of, you know, the role that sharks play in ecosystems, that's actually one that we don't have a very good answer for. And it's probably going to be the case that some species in some locations play an important role in terms of helping control the ecosystem. But in other places, they may not. So there was a recent study uh, that just came out in, in the Great Barrier Reef, for example, showing that the sharks didn't seem to have a big effect on the uh, dynamics of the communities there. So I think you have to look at that on a, on a case by case basis. And it's a really difficult question to answer. I think it's one of those things that everyone assumes we have an answer for, but understanding the role of marine predators, where it's just so difficult to observe what's going on, it is not an easy question to answer. There, there was a follow-up question about the reefs and how, how we think the shark's uh, absence would affect the reefs. And again, this is going to be a, a, on a case, and I couldn't say for the specifics of, of South Florida, but you also have to consider that sharks aren't the only predators on the reef. So there may well be plenty of uh, bony fishes that will occupy a similar trophic level. So in some cases, it may be that if the sharks aren't there, um, the bony fishes sort of occupy the position that the sharks had and the overall effects may not be as dramatic. So it, it, it's, um, it's a challenging question to answer. If you look at marine food webs, they're very complicated. It's why it starts to look like a, a spider web of interactions of who meets whom. And if somebody's taken out of that food web, then those interactions may change and, and the overall effect may be something dramatic happens or everything stays the same. So it, it's a really a complicated question. Okay, great. Well, here's a follow-up for Yanni also. Um, does the upside-down catatonic state technique work with all species of star sharks? Um, to a certain extent, yes. But what we've noticed is that it works best with the larger species. So the larger ones really, you know, go out like a big tiger shark just goes out, out cold. They all show it to a certain degree. Um, but I think especially the larger ones, the uh, response is, is more dramatic. And you had said you think that's might be because of a nerve that gets hit when they're... That's just down? one one explanation I'd heard was that there was pressure on on, on uh, what's called the vagus nerve. And uh, I don't know if Steve or Marianne have something more up to date um, than that. They're shaking their heads no okay <laughs> well it's more it's to really study interesting because it is well known that they do it but the physiological mechanisms behind why this actually works we we don't have worked out and you know if it is something to do with the nerve it would be something for like a sensory physiologist like steve to be able to maybe do those experiments to be able to show exactly how that works but we, we know it happens we don't necessarily understand how or why well i'll say one, one area where you will see it naturally is is sometimes during shark mating which is is pretty violent because the male you know sharks mate very similar to mammals do um but the males will bite the females to control them 
Uh, and often the female will resist. Um, and so what the males often try to do is turn the female upside down um, and she'll, she'll go into this sort of catatonic state. Now saying that, if that was the only reason, then we might expect that only female sharks would go into tonic immobility, but the males do as well. So um, you do see it in their natural lives, but, but as Marion said, we don't really know why or, or how that happens. Great. Carrie, I've got a question for you. Uh, and it says fun question. So that'll be up to you to decide if it's fun or not. Are scientists or actors more challenging to work with? Oh my God. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. Uh, actors are 100% more challenging to work with. <laughs> yeah, probably a good answer. <laughs> yes, yes. Are you kidding me? When I worked with Steven on this film, it was so easy. I mean, he, for, first of all, he's a pro. You said this earlier, he's a pro. But I mean, uh, just easy going and like we're all on the same you know on the same page we're all ha there for a cause and to get his information out if he were an actor oh my god we would have had like 20 reshoots and it, it, oh it, it just would have been a mess so yes so actors are more difficult for sure <laughs> I mean, I've been on your boat before and sometimes you guys are out for like a week or longer on your excursions. I mean, is that challenging just being on the, and it's a, it's a big boat, but still you got, I'm sure you bump into each other a lot. Is that, how difficult is that? Well, when you're, um, when you're trying to make a film, you're trying to stay out of the way as well. Um, so you want their research to happen naturally and for, for us to not interfere, right? Because you want to get what's actually realistically happening. Um, and so uh, you just have to kind of navigate that and, and uh, work with the scientists to move around them properly and make sure you're not in the way. Um, and for longer expeditions, for sure, you're committed. And so you're sleeping in bunks and uh, getting up with the scientific crew and making sure you are filming when they're ready to go. So all hours you're on deck. Um, yeah. Lots of sunscreen, I imagine. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, we, oh, someone asked, if you're snorkeling, um, like many people do in South Florida, and you see a shark, should you do anything in particular? Is there um, an action you should take or just kind of hang out? You should count yourself fortunate and enjoy it. Well, I love that. <laughs> That's what I would say. You, it, it's so rare to be able to seize one of these things uh, if you're if you're snorkeling around. So, um, you know, just say, "Wow, this is really cool." Uh, how close am I to the beach? Maybe I'll go there now, um, and just sort of uh, you know enjoy it. Keep your eyes on it, and maybe get a little closer to the uh, to the shoreline. But for the most part, uh, I think Yanni said earlier, these sharks are so skittish. Um, especially things like the black tips and, and the hammerheads as well. They, they don't like to be around us. And so if you see one, just count yourself fortunate that you actually got a chance to see something like that. So I, I know this has happened a few times in South Florida um, in the past few years that we know about. People are harassing baby nurse sharks and they, get, they latch onto them and then they can't get them off. What... Um, how, what should you do? I guess first one, don't harass the baby nurse sharks. <laughs> Two, if you do and you get, it latches onto you, is there anything that you should do? I mean, again, it, it's extremely easy to avoid getting bitten by a nurse shark. <laughs> Just don't harass it and you won't get bit. It's that simple. <laughs> you know, uh, if you do, uh, and there's even been one case of someone who drowned because they harassed an adult nurse shark and couldn't get back up to the surface. So I think people look at nurse sharks and think that they're placid and harmless and therefore they can harass them. Um, it is fairly well documented that when they, when they bite, you know, they, they tend to hold on. Um, and I'm not really sure what to say other than, you know, often it, it just involves letting the animal, uh, decide to let go um and um eventually it, it, it will uh, you know there's there's uh, the plus with a nurse shark is it doesn't have sharp teeth so it's probably not going to be lacerating but it can you know inflict crushing pressure so it's, it's not uh, trivial either um but again it's very avoidable so there's really no reason for anyone to be getting bitten by by nurse sharks and is there something with them is look don't touch I think Stephen, one time you told me that is there something 
about the gills on a nurse shark or maybe even small ones where um, they can't let go. Like they, they might, maybe they want to let go and they, that they can't cause their gills close up. I could totally be. Nope. I don't remember that in particular, <laughs> um, but I know that what they are able to do is when they, they latch on, they, their mouth can be, they have these little cartilages that fold down on the side that basically form a little suction cup on your, on your arm or something. And when they exert pressure, when they basically suck, it is like a vacuum and they will suck right on. They have to, they have to be the ones to initiate that. They have to be the ones to let go. You can't pull them off. Um, and, uh, it's, it's, you know, I think the best thing to do is keep them in the water, keep their gills submerged. So they've got that opportunity to be able to let go and, and spit you out. Um, if you take them out of the water and walk up to the beach with it stuck on your arm, well, you're not, you're not helping anything. You've basically sealed the vacuum. Um, so keep it in the water. So it has the water flowing over the gills and can release and, and swim on its way. But I, I totally agree with, with, uh, both Marianne and Yanni just, don't do it. Look, don't touch and don't harass them in the first place. And you can avoid all of these problems. Right. Okay. Well, we, have, oh my gosh, it's seven twenty. Okay. So we have a final question. Um, and I, this is for everyone, everyone to chime in. What can we tell the general public about sharks to reduce their fear level and encourage support for shark conservation? I mean, I, I, I can start. I mean, it, it's it's it, it's easy to start quoting statistics. Like the chance of being bitten is extremely low, and and you know we can give you statistics to show that. But the fact is that if you have a fear of something, that may not help. I'm, I'm terrified of flying. Telling me my chances of not crashing is very very low it doesn't help me make me less nervous when I'm flying. So I understand that when you just give out statistics, it doesn't necessarily, if you're scared of sharks, doesn't make a, a difference. Um, I guess all I can say is that, you know, these are uh, truly uh, amazing animals. And uh, in certain places, at least, there's a lot of them out there. Um, and there's a lot of humans in the water. And the number of negative interactions is, is very, very small. We really just hear about the negative interactions because obviously that makes the news, but you, you don't hear about the interactions or the, the lack of interaction, I should say, when there's humans in the waters and there's sharks around because a lot of the time you don't know there's a shark there, but they are there. Um, and so you kind of have this sort of uh, bias towards the, the negative interactions. Um, so I, I guess uh, I'm not out there to, to suddenly tell people that, you know, it's irrational to be scared of sharks because uh, that's not how fears and phobias work. Um, but uh, they're just truly uh, amazing a animals. And, and um, again, your chance of anything bad happening is, is very, very low. But uh, that's probably the, the best words I can, <laughs> I can give. I, I will go back to look, don't touch. If you take that approach when you go into nature, in all all nature, right? Just look, don't touch. You're probably going to be much safer than if you if you take another approach. And and um, like Yanni, I, I mean, there are a lot of stats, right? But I just think you know, sharks have been around for 450 million years. Um, they're really important um, for a lot of things. We can learn a lot about them. We can learn a lot about ocean food webs. Yanni was saying, you know. It, it changes depending on the shark and where you are. So they're so important, um, potentially ecologically. Um, we can learn a lot from them by understanding their anatomy and physiology. So um, we're, we're really lucky to have them around. And if you look and don't touch, you're probably going to be just fine. I guess I would just um, say that when it comes to uh, you know, overcoming, you know, fears about them, you know, knowledge goes a long way to informing people. And the more you know, the less afraid you are. And so I think we have a, a real opportunity as scientists to inform the public and, and teach them about the animals and teach them why these animals are so interesting. And the more people know about them, maybe the more excited they'll become. And, you know, the more, the more interested they will be in the animals. And I think this is 
uh, a great opportunity for us to, you know, work with, uh, you know, people like Carrie here, who's creating this content that will be disseminated through, you know, through schools and, and everywhere else. So uh, more people will learn about the animals and hopefully that goes a long way to, uh, to reducing fear. I'll, I'll just add, Stephen, that was really well put. I mean, uh, don't make assumptions about the animals, right? Educate yourself. Um, and you guys are already doing that by attending this panel. So just keep at it and, um, and, and uh, you know, do research and don't just take what the media says or what movies tell you. Actually, like, look into these things if you have questions. Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much for everyone who attended. Um, we had some amazing questions tonight. Often I go into interviews and sometimes I don't even know enough to ask the right questions, but it, with the educated questions we got, I think we had some really smart, uh, sharp people on the call or on the presentation. Um, I just want to, uh, oh, we appreciate you submitting your questions and I wanted to thank all the panelists. And I also wanted to recognize our presenting hosts, uh, which was the Anjari Foundation um, and the Palm Beach Post. Um, as well as all of tonight's supporters. Uh, thank you guys, everyone, and have a great night.